Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. I'm Council Member Robert Cornegy, Chair of the Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings, and we're here to hold a vote on one bill related to single occupant toilet rooms, two bills related to building safety, and a series of bills related to removing certain residential properties from the city's third party transfer program. Proposed intro 465A would require DOB in conjunction with a number of other agencies to increase awareness of the existing requirements that single occupant toilet rooms be available for use by persons of any gender. DOB would also be required to post an annual report on the program, as well as data on complaints and violations issued for failure to comply with the existing requirement. Proposed intro number 664A would require carbon monoxide detectors in all commercial spaces and proposed intro 836A would streamline DOB and FDNY approval processes for certain fire plans and systems by requiring only FDA, FDNY approval. Finally, there are 13 pre-considered bills before the committee that would remove the applicable properties from the city's third party transfer program. I'm joined today by well, I got Barry Grudenchik, uh, Margaret Chin, Raphael Espinal, and Fernando Cabrera. Oh, and Ben Kalos is here. Oh, sorry, Ben. I know. Um, we will have uh, an opening statement by Councilmember Kalos. I want to thank the Housing and Buildings Chair, uh, Robert Cornegie, for his leadership on the uh, third party transfer issue. Uh, the process is that the properties come before this committee for approval and come to the Planning Disposition and Concession Subcommittee, which I chair, to uh, determine whether or not the building should receive an Article 11 tax abatement, uh, wherein the properties don't have to pay taxes for 40 years. Uh, during our hearings and relating to properties previously approved, uh, we raised questions around whether or not HPD had properly uh, conducted their outreach to buildings, and uh, in that process, uh, we had uh, we, we learned that several property owners uh, had lost their property despite having. Uh, tried to work with HPD, and in one in particular case, they actually had worked with the city to pay things off, only to see their property still uh, taken. Uh, following a lot of the oversight, we actually saw 30 properties removed from the previous set, and I just want to thank the housing chair, Robert Cornegy, who has been a champion on this issue. He has dug deep. He has worked with individual landlords. He has worked uh, and uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with him and the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus uh, around really magnifying this issue. I also want to thank two elected officials in this room. Uh, sorry, a, a, our, our current uh, uh, elected official, Assemblymember Al Taylor, as well as a, uh, a, the Democratic nominee for uh, State Senate, Robert Jackson, a former member of this august body, uh, both of whom are here on this issue. And uh, council is on this issue. Uh, we are being even more watchful. Uh, we are not going to take HPD's word for it again. And uh, we will make sure that these properties, uh, when and if they are transferred, that they are done for the benefit of the tenants. Uh, and that we really make sure that this, proper, this program is used properly. Uh, thank you. So <clears throat> I certainly agree with my colleague. Um, we are working diligently to uh, correct uh, some issues that are present with it. But um, as they say in the Deep South, we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. So there is a lot of work uh, and a TPT town hall scheduled for uh, November 15th at Brooklyn Law School at 6 p.m., where we'll be doing an either deeper dive uh, into the issues uh, and the disproportionate effect of TPT on particular communities. Uh, so with that, um, we'll, we'll hear from the first panel, uh, Assemblymember Al Taylor, and I'm just gonna go ahead and say it, Senator Robert Jackson, Tyrone Farley, and Lauren Santos. Uh, 
before we get started, I do want to um, welcome back Robert Jackson to these chambers. Um, Robert Jackson uh, was in office before I took office and was somebody who I was able to emulate some of my um, uh, prowess and uh, uh, vigor and zest around issues that are germane to especially communities of color, especially around education. I, I want to thank you for setting uh, the bar very high for those of us who followed behind you. So you can begin by uh, introducing yourselves um, for the record uh, and your testimony. Um, it, it has been my practice that chivalry is not dead. So you don't have to follow that, but I'm just saying. Sorry, good morning. My name is Darlene Bruce. I'm counsel to Assemblyman Al Taylor. He's providing the testimony today. Good morning, my name is Lauren Santos. I'm representing 6769 St. Nicholas HDFC. I'm Robert Jackson, good morning everyone. I'm a uh, Democratic nominee for the New York State Senate in the 31st Senatorial District. It includes all of Northern Manhattan, Marble Hill, Inwood, Washington Heights, part of West Harlem, Upper West Side, part of Midtown, and it snakes down into Chelsea area, 26th Street and 9th Avenue, 13 miles long. Good morning, um, Assembly Member Al Taylor. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Tyrone Farley. I represent 157 HDFC, 123rd Street. So while I understand that around this issue of TPT, there's a, uh, a credible amount of passion, I'm just going to ask um, that we condense the remarks as possible uh, and ask for just a, a, because of the two uh, my two colleagues in government who are present will make the clock at four minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's four minutes per person? Oh, okay. uh, 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 that's the only way it could happen around here. There's, sometimes <laughs> it should be the other way, but no, it's four minutes uh, uh, okay. per person. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, good morning to this body. Um, again, my name is Al Taylor, and I've submitted a copy of my testimony, and I'll read it for you as well to put it in the records. Uh, I am a member of the New York State Assembly who sits on the Housing Committee. I represent the 71st Assembly District, where there are a significant number of HDFCs who are facing or on the verge of facing foreclosures or being considered to be placed in third-party um, transfer program. As a representative of my constituents who are shareholders in these HDFCs, I decided to host a series of forums entitled The Crisis Facing HDFCs. We address various issues, including foreclosure, the regulatory agreement, and corporate governance. Our next forum will cover the topics of predatory lending and upgrading the HDFC's infrastructure. We are also implementing a pilot project to match shareholders with pro bono counsel who can guide the HDFC through the maze of legal issues and answer those their specific questions. The purpose of each of the forums was to give shareholders, directors, community boards, and elected officials the information needed to address the issues facing the residents of HDFCs. These forums have been attended by approximately 100 to 150 individuals seeking answers to their questions. Attendees, giving, attendees were given tools to improve governance, increase their understanding of HPD, learn their shareholder rights, and assist property managers comply with their obligations. Panelists have been elected officials, panelists have been elected uh, officials, attorneys, members of the HDFC coalition, shareholders, directors, and property managers. I stand, you, I stand before you today uniquely qualified to testify not only as a member of the New York State Assembly who has hosted forums on HDFCs, but also as a stakeholder in the HDFC community. I am a shareholder in an HDFC. Therefore, I testify sincerely as a shareholder who has endured both the legal and financial hardships and other challenges to avoid the foreclosure process. Let me assure you that the HDFC that I reside in is not among those currently being considered for third-party transfer. 
While my building is not on this list, I am a shareholder in a HDFC facing our second match in court with a predatory lender as a shareholder in litigation. I often wonder how my builder became financially obligated to pay a note on a loan used to rehabilitate my building where the work has never, never been completed nor a certificate of occupancy issued. The question is not unique to my HDFC and through the series of forums, I learned that this type of predatory lending occurs often in the Harlem community. It is a known fact that the contractors oftentimes are scound with the HDFC funds without completing the work on the building, use poor quality material and unprofessional workmanship, necessitating short-term repairs. I stand here today to testify not only of the HDFCs that the HDFCs are dysfunctional, there are excellent directors sitting on boards where they are doing their best. Some have been misguided by predatory lenders or ripped off by general contractors who did not complete the required work. Shareholders feel abandoned yet again when city agencies find the buildings for violations or even worse, assess penalties and fees for the failures caused by the predatory lenders and their contractors. In this vicious cycle, shareholders are burdened and overwhelmed with escalating costs leveled by the city and causing many in the community to believe that the HDFCs were set up to fail. I hear stories from my community listening to corrupt, uh, corrupt entities who come into our neighborhoods targeting those who cannot advocate for themselves. These shareholders have been unknowingly led into financial commitments or have paid money to contractors yet left without heat and hot water throughout the winter months. I stand here today to share these stories with you to tell you that the TPT program is not the only solution for HDFCs who are sued by, who are sued by predatory lenders, um, pay legal fees to fight in court, placed in grips of a trustee, and then tr thrust into yet another program, losing all ownership rights. The HDFCs must be given a voice. They must receive the tools and resources to address their aforementioned challenges, and they must be afforded an opportunity to fight against those who prey upon our communities. I stand here today not to challenge the wisdom of this council. Rather, I stand here today to request on behalf of my constituents a moratorium on both the foreclosures of HDFCs and their transfer to TPT programs. We all are aware that the late 1970s was a period when the city seized property from derelict owners who abandoned their buildings. In response to the city's desire to move out of managing and owning buildings, the city created the HDFC, a type of co-op housing for low-income New Yorkers. The majority of these income-restricted units were sold to tenants residing in these abandoned buildings as a mechanism to stop the displacement of tenants into shelter to transfer city-owned property into tenant-managed projects and return these buildings back to the city to collect real estate taxes. Essentially, the city created a program that would save affordable housing units that would prevent the destruction of city-owned property caused by fires, preserve the landmark status of these buildings, and decrease the number of abandoned buildings operated as drug dens and buildings susceptible to other forms of criminal activity. Many of the residents in these buildings were given an opportunity for the first time in several generations to become property owners. This form of ownership did not come to the residents without risk of harm to themselves or their children. In my opinion, it is important to note that the TPT program does not acknowledge the sweat equity earned by the shareholders. Rather, the city chooses through the P TPT program to give the equity to a third party who has not sacrificed nor invested anything to safeguard the building nor the community from the 70s until today. Shareholders return to the status of shareholders are returned to the status of renters because of the TPT program and punished for failing to voluntarily operate a cooperation, uh, a cooperation in efficient manner. Shareholders feel like they have been slapped in the face while being robbed of any financial benefit or investing in their unit, their HDFC, and their community. Given the risk taken by both the city and the shareholders, it seems counterproductive 
to know to, to now turn over the buildings in some instances to not-for-profit entities whose intent is not to preserve affordable housing, stabilize the neighborhood, nor the community at large. Rather, these investors are focused on making a profit as their title indicates. I witnessed far too many constituents and family and friends removed on a daily basis from their apartment by these for-profit entities. Many of these investors remove existing low-income tenants to replace them with tenants who are able to pay much higher market rates. The inclusion for profit corporation into HDFC community serves only to destabilize the community, the Harlem community, by eliminating affordable housing. Unfortunately, the original tenant, intent of the HDFC is undermined due to TPT program because it leads to the displacement of tenants, con contributes to the destabilization of communities, and negates the opportunities for home ownership to those who have been living in Harlem for years. I encourage you to vote against the TPT program, HDFCs who attempt to comply with the mandates of HPD. I firmly believe that if given the resources, the HDFC community has the strength, the ability, and the commitment to rebuild their infrastructures and to succeed. As an alternative to the TPT program, I suggest appointment of our busman assigned to each borough for the next 10 years given uh, the abusman five-year reporting requirements back to the council on the progress of HDFCs. The abusman would provide the same incentives offered to the for-profit corporation investors. If the uh, ombudsman program is acceptable, then more checks and balances would be given so that it is not being wasted to achieve, time is not being wasted to achieve success. Further, in the reference forums, we are finding that the shareholders are asking for specific legal and financial assistance. Perhaps a forensic audit can be conducted to determine what resources are needed by each building and such resources should be provided to strengthen those HDFCs that are now functioning and to assist those where challenges exist. In my conclusion, in, press, in, in a press release issued October 18, um, public advocate Latish James, she called for a temporary freeze on third party transfer program to address recent concerns about New Yorkers losing their homes in error. There has been recent concern that homes being foreclosed upon, um, um, upon without sufficient notice to the homeowners. This temporary freeze would allow HBD to address these concerns and to ensure that the agency has adequate safeguards in place to project homeowners whose properties enter the program. There are many other elected officials and shareholders who are also calling for a moratorium on the TPT program and to place a halt on the pipeline of HDFCs awaiting transfer. I also respectfully request a moratorium on all foreclosures in HDFCs slated for the TPT. I ask for this moratorium to be implemented until such time as a comprehensive audit is conducted and a functioning system is implemented similar to the proposed ombudsman program. I believe in our HDF community and humbly ask that the council consider the original intent of forming the HDFC, uh, original intent of forming the HDFC and preserving this intent as well as the units needed in New York for affordable housing, respectfully submitted. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Assemblymember. Did I go past that? <laughs> Good morning, Chair Carnegie and members of the City Council. It's good to be back in the house that uh, we built, the people of New York City. Uh, I'm Robert Jackson, the Democratic nominee for the New York State Senate, 31st Senatorial District. As I indicated, it includes a large portion of Manhattan. But I'm here this morning in order to support the HDFC Coalition, more specifically, uh, members uh, Edonis Rodriguez and members Mark Levine, and all the other members, but specifically those two, because they have uh, properties within their councilmatic district, which is part of the state senate district in which I represent. Uh, understanding that uh, from my history as a member of this body from uh, January 2002 until December 31st, 2013, I advocated uh, for uh, people that were part of, uh, had, um, uh, H HDFC uh, 
buildings that were trying to be uh, cooperatives and encourage them to do everything they can to save their homes. And I knew that some of them, because of the lack of training, the lack of, of follow-up, they were losing their homes. And I talked to them in their homes, and I tell them I feel like kicking them in their butt like a family member because once they lose this opportunity to have uh, cooperatives that they own, in my opinion, based on their economic situation, they will never have that chance again. And so I always talked about with HBD, tell me how these people can become owners and not renters. And that's what it's about. I wish that I owned my own home, but I don't. But I'm struggling every day to make sure that the people that we represent uh, are trying to keep their homes. And I say to you that uh, knowing that Councilmember Rodriguez and Councilmember Levine, when you look at uh, many of the properties, I think Councilmember Levine has the most out of all of the council members in the city of New York. And so obviously I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about people standing in their homes and being a part of what they will call their own. And you should know that I'm a member of a group called Northern Manhattan is not for sale. We're fighting to make sure that people who are born and raised in their communities can continue to live there. And so that's a struggle not only with rental units, but it's a struggle with units that have taken over by the city and rehab and or in the process through the uh, TPT program. And so that's why I'm here today. And I want to talk about ownership and not rental. I want to talk about the fact that I was up in Albany uh, at the the Black, Lati Black Puerto Rican Latino Asian Caucus retreat where uh, members of the state Senate, um, more specifically Velmanette Montgomery and others from Brooklyn talked about, they were requesting, and I'm reading from a letter that went to the commissioner, uh, Maria Torres Springer, uh, Mayor de Blasio, and others, uh, chief judges and around the state, and I'll just read a little part of it. We are requesting a moratorium on the further transfer of ownership and imposition of third party managers and at each of the properties and on the further implementation of the city's third party transfer program until an investigation can be conducted to determine the following at the very least. And it goes on. But I'm telling you that this is such an issue and our job as elected public officials is to do the right thing for the people that we represent to try to keep them in their homes and not turn over the properties in which they could own over to private developers or even community-based organizations. That should be the absolute last thing that we even consider. But everything else should be done beforehand in order to help these people uh, uh, live in their homes and own their own properties. And I thank you for the opportunity to come in front of you this morning to give my little two cents on this particular matter. It's extremely important with the survival of the city of New York. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, good morning. Good morning. My name is Darlene Bruce, and I'm counsel to Assemblyman Al Taylor. Each day, some, someone comes into the office um, sharing their stories, the problems that they have. Um, in their units, in these HDFCs. So many of them don't, do not have a voice, and they come to us seeking help. So I come here today to be the voice for them, to share with you the stories that they tell us each and every day about losing their homes, losing the ownership of what they invested in for some 30 odd years. So I ask you today to think about these individuals that come in every day, real people coming in every day, worrying where they're going to live for the next day. What are they gonna do? Where are, gonna, where are they gonna place their children? So I ask you to consider that the units that are being placed in the TPT program have real people behind them, have real stories behind them, and they're looking for an opportunity to just get a place to live. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you for your time, council members. My name is Lauren Santos. Um, I'm representing 67, 69 St. Nicholas HDFC in Harlem. Um, I want to thank council member Bill Perkins, who has given us a lot of support during this hard time. 
And I would be remiss not to thank the HDFC Coalition and their fervent support and knowledge of all of the issues at hand. Um, you guys rock. Um, 6769 St. Nicholas Avenue is a 26 unit HDFC apartment building in West Harlem. A year ago, we were notified of the foreclosure. Um, at that time, we had had no elections for nearly a decade. The board was previously run by a family. And um, at that time, we uncovered that we owed almost a million dollars um, in taxes. Um, as I'm sure you guys have heard from plenty of other shareholders and HTFC um, tenants, we were never notified by HPD of the back taxes that were owed. Um, we have worked fervently to get our HPD, uh, our HDFC out of the hole. Um, we had two elections, um, which were ta challenged by the old board. Um, they were certified by NHS, but the old board took us to court anyway. Um, we waited three months from the, uh, to hear a decision from the Supreme Court um, of New York State. Um, which really put a hold on the progress that we could make. Um, we, the old board stopped paying bills. Um, they continued to neglect the property and put up a pretty damn, damn good fight in um, relinquishing control. Um, after that, um, after August, in which we heard from the New York State Supreme Court, um, we were finally able to start pushing ahead in terms of making real um, progress in saving the building. Uh, unfortunately, um, the payments that we have made to DEP and other city agencies, the, the large sums of money that we have paid, they're not being applied to the actual debt. It's, they're being applied to interest and late fees, and so we're not really making a dent in terms of what we need to get done to really get us out of foreclosure. That being said, we have really forged ahead, and there have been, there's been a lot of work um, done. Um, we have made two sales, which have gone towards um, putting some money back into the HDFC's pocket, and the um, bank accounts. Um, so what I'm really asking for our HDFC is that in addition to the tax amnesty, if that's granted, that it comes with no strings attached because the regulatory agreements and the late fees and the interest that's applied to any debts that the HDFCs owe, it's not really realistic in terms of getting us out of getting us where we need to be to, to be a successful HDFC. Um, I have faith that 6769 can be the amazing, incredible, vibrant, uh, low and middle income affordable housing that it can be, but we really do need the assistance of the city council to make that happen. So I just wanna thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your time, council members. My name is Tyrone Farley. I'm a shareholder of 157 West 123rd HDFC, and I am here representing them as well. I am here to plead to save our building during this critical time as we move forward. Our board has been working very hard to ensure we prevent this from happening again with a zero tolerance policy and procedure We've had many challenges, and as I listen to everyone's stories that's spoken before me, we also have similar stories, and I'm here on behalf of grandmothers, aunts, working mothers, fathers, grandparents, and single parents as well who couldn't be here, myself included. I've taken days off all weekend. I've I'm currently the president, the new board president for the, our building to ensure that we are in a line in everything that is required to prevent us from foreclosure. 
we've had a lot of challenges. One of the big challenges have been, uh, or hands been tied with a lot of uh, financial mismanagement. We've been able to overcome that by having a new uh, management take care of our building. So that's been very helpful for us. We've been able to have a sale of one of our building that's helped us financially as well. In addition to that, they've been able to help us a lot on the legal side with managing some, a lot of our units with people in arrears, among others. But I'm here to plead on behalf of people who don't have a voice, uh, grandmothers. Um, during this past weekend, for example, um, one of our list of items was collecting the incomes of verification. Um, I, myself, as well as Allison, who's here today, as, along with the HDFC coalition, Glory Ann, and Victor as well, has helped us tirelessly, tirelessly in ensuring that we were able to get everything that is required um, as we approach our deadline to prevent a foreclosure. Um, but again, I want to speak for grandparents and 97-year-old who we've gone to their units who are unable to work. And if we were to lose our building, they would have nowhere to stay. Single parents who couldn't be here today because they work on a fixed salary income to pay their bills, who are shareholders and some who are tenants as well. A big thank you to Honorable Bill Perkins, who has been working with us tirelessly from day one to help us as well. I myself, like I said, I'm a hardworking shareholder who've paid tens of thousands of dollars of my savings for my apartment. I've lived at my building for over a decade. I'm very scared of losing everything that I saved for and worked and support to help my building during this critical time as well and during our time of distress. And finally, I stand here to testify and plea on behalf of our building to remove us from, our, from this list of foreclosure and we encourage you to vote in favor of, remo of removing us as well. And we thank you for your time. Thank you. Before I get some questions from my colleagues, I want to acknowledge the presence of uh, Councilmember Jamani Williams, Councilmember Carlina Rivera, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, Councilmember Mark Jonai, and Councilmember Richie Torres. Uh, I believe um, I, I had a, a couple of questions. Um, uh, first, uh, to Assemblymember Al Taylor. Um, so, you think that there are resources that should be um, administered uh, to HDFCs in particular uh, that could assist them going forward. If you could just, uh, uh, for myself and my colleagues, list one or two of those resources mm -hmm. that you think firsthand would have been um, crucial in, I, in, in helping HDFCs. I, I, I think um, in the initial transfer when we bought into the uh, HDFCs, um, based on what you've heard so far, you, you take tenants that are typically not um, property owners and way out of the league and you get a crash course from a third party group that says, now you're gonna do this, go do this. And I, I think um, HPD has not properly equipped and provided the resources to transfer us in. When I say um, resources, whether it's um, financial resources in or whether it's, um, uh, I'm gonna say intellect, so the people that are talented that are there. So I have a roof that they did and I have a boiler that they put in my building, but I'm not a boiler, I'm not a roofer, but five years later we find out we have the wrong boiler, we find out that the roof wasn't really repaired, we find out there's no certificate of occupancy, but now we're paying, we've moved up um, and we're paying the money uh, our maintenance because we have a loan out there, but the services that we're paying for, we never receive. And I think HPD has a responsibility, not just to come in and take these things down, but look back and say, hey, did these contractors do what they were supposed to do? And, and are things, you know, a check and balance? And because there's no check and balance, a lot of what I believe we are facing and probably others is because they failed to do their job. We are now trying to, um, we've been given a ship with a hole in it, and we're bailing most of it. And I think when you look at where 
the properties are doing well, there tends to be a change in the ethnicity and the finances that are available in those properties. So you can see how some might do a little bit better because of management, money, and so forth like that. And I think HPD could and must do better. Did I, I don't know if I answered your question. No, you definitely answered my question, but uh, I think about general home ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think about the home ownership in this perspective where uh, properties decades ago were transferred to a home ownership model, which mm -hmm. I, I think was a great model. I think uh, uh, the pathway is to home, uh, it, it's so understated, yes. uh, this American dream through home ownership and the pathways to home ownership. And in minority communities, mm -hmm. uh, pr predominantly it is through uh, condo and co-op ownership mm -hmm. and building equity and transfer of wealth and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, but when I think about um, a general ownership, it doesn't come with a manual, mm -hmm. generally. Yes. But you believe in this instance, there should be not a manual, but a responsibility on the uh, seller to, 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 to do what exactly? Um, I'm, I'm, what comes to mind is buyer beware. Um, and when you're uninformed and you, you have, which is to your point, it's, it's, a, it's a blessing to be able to, to move into ownership, especially um, coming out of certain communities where you would, otherwise not have that opportunity. The this, this city, I believe, has a greater responsibility to put those things there. And I think as a homeowner, and you understand what you have, and, and work from there. I am responsible for my maintenance. I'm responsible for the things that happen within my, my property. But I am not necessarily responsible for understanding that this boiler that they put in is the wrong size, that the roof that I'm paying this extra money for, that was never done. They just put a couple of planks. and now. These are your expenses, and going forward, the bank is not interested in knowing whether those things have happened or not. They're going to hit you with your mortgage, and if you fail to pay the mortgage, they're moving in to get your property. The city looks at you and says, well, you guys aren't managing your property well. And I'm saying, well, isn't that the pot calling the kettle black? Because they've not done a good job either. So I just want to say, um, we heard testimony uh, a little over a month ago uh, in, in our hearing mm -hmm. uh, from some property uh, some TPT, uh, I'm sorry, some property owners who actually testified that they didn't want the responsibility of ownership. So they didn't want the responsibility of having to know about the boiler or the roof. Mm -hmm. And they actually preferred the TPT process because it allowed, it, it absolved them of responsibility, but it also gave them an opportunity mm -hmm. to live in a condition mm -hmm. that they thought was appropriate um, and it was safe. And so, so there, you know, this, this idea between ownership and rental is one that I've had discussion for 30 years with people and the different and the varying mentalities. Um, so I just want to be sure that we're we're be, we're doing our due diligence and being responsible to those who want to Absolutely. and who are committed. We've heard testimony from from obviously from HDFCs who are committed to being homeowners. You you mentioned yours, but there are some who literally came in and said we're relieved that the responsibility doesn't lie on us to have to call the oil truck and or I, to have to make these necessary repairs. And I think somewhere in between, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the education process Absolutely. has to take place because it sounds exciting when the offer of home ownership. I would add this. Um, sometimes in, in the middle of the night, in those dead winters when you have not, and I don't want to say anything inappropriate, um, but if you've been a bruise for so long, and then someone comes along and says, I'm going to take this off your hands. You, you are relieved because, you know what, I'd rather pay someone and do that and know that I'm going to get this, I'm going to get that. But it comes at a cost because if it was put up in the initial, in the, um, initial, nego in the initial um, negotiating and you had those things, it's like you've been abused for so long, you're happy to have something. You know what, I don't want this problem anymore. Just take it away. I'm happy to go into that program. But that's because people give up sometimes in the middle of the fight, but I'm like, heck no. When I came in, man, my building was crack addicted, gunfire all night long, and now it's a sexy place to live, and people, oh, we wanna do this. I say, no, I think we should hold the city responsible for um, years of neglect at best, and say, I don't want, and, and to your point, perhaps maybe, um, maybe a case-by-case -case study to say, okay, this works, this doesn't, as opposed to a cookie cutter and say, this is what it is, this is what it's not. And, and I would say this, when properties are going to the TPT, 
than the, the, the uh, enormous bills and fees that are associated with their property somehow disappear. And if they're willing to give the same thing to the shareholders that they're giving to the uh, TPT, I would say, hey, it's an it's a easy deal. Wipe us or put that money somewhere and give us the same chance, if it makes sense. It definitely Thank makes sense. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank Chair. You. Uh, uh, Fernando Cabrera. Thank you so much uh, to the chair and welcome. It's good to see my former colleague, uh, Robert Jackson, Assemblyman, it's good to see you, everyone present. Uh, this has been an issue that, I, to be honest with you, I've been very, very frustrated about. I was at the same hearing, and, uh, and I, I did address this very issue uh, with HPD that I didn't think they were doing a good enough job in providing the training. Mm -hmm. And having said that, the other part that I'm, I'm a bit frustrated is that by the time it gets to us, mm -hmm. I see the million dollar debt that they're in and trying to decide what do we do here when the maintenance have been very, very low, 200 $300 mm -hmm. for many, many, many years, and how do you get yourself out of that hole? Uh, how much time is it going to take? Is it realistic that they're, they're going to be able to get? There's some that we call every day for weeks. We didn't get no calls back. I mean, I'm, I'm like, you're about to lose your property. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then there is the piece that you both mentioned, which at the end of the day is about leadership. Somebody has to grab this by the horn. And so what happens when you don't have that leadership? What happens when you have the homeowners who said, let somebody else do it, but there is no somebody else? And those are the questions that I would love to get some answers, if there are answers to, uh, to those. Thank you. Um, so uh, since we've had the board, or the election that was certified by the NHS, since that was um, held up in court, um, I want to say that the residents um, have really rallied around the new board. There's a lot of support um, behind the new board, um, and the board is committed to really turning the building around and fostering a sense of community, especially, I think, um, especially where I, I, my mother is the shareholder. I live two blocks away from her. I grew up in central Harlem, so... I know that it's a community that's rapidly changing, and um, I think that that as an element of tension, especially when you're in a low to middle income housing unit. Um, so I'm very confident that the residents have fostered a bond, especially through this really this period of conflict, that they don't want to lose their homes. They have just as much equity as the next person. And so they're committed to not having to leave that behind. I know that TPT is sold that, you know, you don't get displaced, displaced but the reality is that it can happen. And so these residents are committed to keeping their equity and making sure that not only do they keep their equity, but that in one or two or three years, the building really has the potential to flourish the way that we feel that it has the potential to flourish. And um, it is a big number that I said. <laughs> There's no doubt about that, but um, we're in a position to steer the ship in another direction, but we do need the assistance of the city council. But, but you're there, right? You're there, you're hustling, you're making things happen, you're moving, you're both working very hard. But what happens when you're in a building where you have the seniors that you mentioned and they're just, be honest with you, they're tired, somebody don't want to grab this responsibility. What do you do at that moment? What happens in that situation? Is there something the coalition is suggesting that should be taking place? The second piece uh, that, you know, just thinking outside of the box, instead of us waiting for HPD, why not ask HPD to give funding to the coalition so the coalition could provide the training since you guys are the ones who are the grassroots, you are uh, in the front lines, 
you, you know what needs to take place in order to save the building. So uh, I am able to speak um, hands-on because of this past two weeks with the help of the HDFC uh, Coalition Board. Uh, and I know for sure that there are resources and like you mentioned, perhaps some of the resources may not have been utilized, but I do know when people step, step, up, step up to the plate or to those challenges, they are being utilized. So for example, this past weekend, the resource of the HDFC coalition in everything that they have experienced in the past with similar scenarios and challenges, they've been able to pass on to us in supporting us all weekend long um, in ensuring that we're here today, for example, we are here on time, we are here to testify, we are here to provide all the required paperwork, we are here to have a uh, new board of, elect, uh, uh, board of directors for a building to ensure that we have guidance for management among others um, in ensuring that we are in the right direction. So I really believe that people, shareholders and tenants do want to make a difference, they do want to save their homes, and there are resources that are there to help us. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, if I may, yes. can I answer a question also? Um, through the forums that we've been having um, in the community, people have been coming and learning new things about, especially corporate governance. Um, not everybody knows what it, the duties and responsibilities are for the board. And so we um, just did a PowerPoint presentation, show them what their bylaws and how important their even stock certificate is. So there may have been training at some point, but to renew the training process so that the new generation because she represents a generation her mother may have purchased, but she's the next generation there. So she needs to also be trained, N not taking anything away from oh, her, very good. but the next generation needs to be trained as to what are the responsibilities, what are the instruments that are important, what are the provisions of those instruments, and how they could come into compliance, even if there was a period where there was nothing being done. So the new generation needs to be trained and, and have those tools and resources available to them. And I agree with you 100%, and that's what I'm after. We don't have a system, and systems are regular, they're inst institutionalized. We don't have a way to, to have an ongoing discussion, plan. There's nothing in place uh, for this to happen, so we don't end up, look, I, in my district, we were able to say some. We literally had to pass the legislation to stop the TPT from taking place. But I don't want us to get to this place because it's very painful, it's very scary for everybody going uh, through it. Uh, and it just puts you in a financial instability whenever you have to go to the bank and they're, they're gonna be concerned. I'm, I, you know, I'm gonna get money that's gonna eventually get lost here. Uh, and so I'm hopeful that, uh, Mr. Chair, we could work with HPD and their coalition to come up with a system that actually uh, is permanent and actually work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Before I go to um, some, sh some sh uh, quick remarks uh, from my uh, colleagues, I wanna say that, um, uh, I don't want the uh, manner by which I conduct these hearings, especially around TPT, to be misconstrued as me not understanding the care and compassion and concern for these residents and TPTs. I have a responsibility. A responsible chairman uh, governs his hearings in an unbiased fashion. That does not mean that I don't have a particular infinity, affinity for uh, individuals who are striving for home ownership, especially those of color in our communities. It also doesn't mean that I don't understand that there is a responsibility incumbent upon the city and HPD to provide some resources that will be of assistance going forward. So I just want to state that because I, I realize that um, I, I have a particular style in my chairmanship. I don't want that to be misconstrued for not caring. Um, so we have uh, statements coming from first uh, Council Member Williams, my predecessor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Assembly Member. 
and soon to be officially state senator. Um, and everyone who's here and the, share, uh, the shareholders. And a big shout out to uh, HDFC who's been uh, keeping us, uh, this and the people who are suffering um, in our faces. And you, you gotta continue uh, to do that. And I did wanna shout out uh, Kings, County, Kings County Politics, I see the editor here, for particularly the TPT uh, problems. And sometimes it takes um, press to, to really point out some egregious behavior that's going on. So I just want to shout them out. Uh, before I talk about TPT in particular, I did want to talk about HDFC. Um, I do know, um, oh, I do want to thank uh, the chair and the speaker for making sure that these buildings we're going to vote on are removed and try to take quick action based on what we saw. I do have a building that does call for more time on, on TPT, uh, but I also know that the body is working on it uh, to see what we can do. Um, I remember the the council was able to prevent some changes that was going to happen uh, last year when HPD was gonna put uh, a one size fits all on HDFCs. Uh, I did wanna know what has come of that, those changes uh, since then. They had also made some promises and just wanna know if anything had changed uh, since th there was kind of pause on the changes they wanted to make with the HDFCs. If you know, you may not. Are you speaking to the regulatory agreement? Yes. Um, as far as we've been informed, um, there is nothing coming down the pike yet. They, they stop and they're reassessing. They may come back with another, but right now there is no um, agreement that they're pushing. Okay. If I may, um, my understanding is that with the tax amnesty that's offered, you have to sign a regulatory agreement that, that, the, that the HDFC that gets the tax amnesty must um, agree to the regulatory agreement that HPD has in place. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, if we can just take a, a uh, the committee could take a look, a look at that. Um, um, I, I know they did put a pause on it um, overall. Maybe they've changed it a little bit, but I'd like to see what the problem was, if I remember correctly. They were kind of had a one size fits all uh, for all of them, and that was uh, proving to be very problematic. Thank you. Councilmember Kalos. I want to thank the assembly member and Democratic nominee and just the entire panel for coming out here. So I, one of the last comments was something I just wanted to agree with, which is just, um, and I guess I'll ask him the phrase of a question because it's kind of like Jeopardy in this job. You, you have to ask the question for the answer you want to hear, hopefully, and sometimes. Uh, is it seems when a property is being taken away from an HDFC, the first thing the city does is eliminate all the tax debt. The second thing it does is eliminate all the water debt. The third thing the city does is offer the new, sometimes a for-profit developer, up to, I believe, $90,000 per unit that they're taking to do renovations. Then they offer them 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 million dollars in tax abatements running for the next 40 years. Uh, has any of that been offered to existing HDFC tenants? No. <laughs> Just <laughs> and and, and uh, assembly member, it seems that you, you, uh, do, would that be something that you think that HPD should be offering to the HDFC tenants versus a, a for-profit developer who's being handed home ownership units? If HDFC, I'm sorry, if HPD offered half of that, I'd be ecstatic. <laughs> it, it's a game changer. It's a game changer with the training that's been suggested um, and where to put money and then take that off. That's pressure that doesn't need to be there. Um, and to, to your point, if you go down that avenue and you give all those goodies like it's Halloween to those new folk, then there's no way that property is going to remain low income and affordable even for the residents that are there. So they may be saved for the moment, but it won't last long. When a property is put in as part of the regulatory agreement, the existing tenants are protected. They have to, they, they, their rent usually goes up from a rent controlled rent uh, to 30% of their income. Uh, is that often a burden for those tenants who are on a fixed income? And similarly, the vacant units all of a sudden become available to people at 150% of AMI, which would be if it's a one bedroom or studio, $120,000 a year. Mm -hmm. 
is that the right rate for the vacant units or should it be a different rate for those vacant units? I think that's a whole nother conversation in hearing. Um, I would say yes, that there certainly should be. I'm not prepared to give an answer to what it should be, but certainly, um, and, and I'm concerned some folks that are there, even though it's 30%, the AMI is not what it used to be. So um, for Harlem, our AMI is connected to the income out of Westchester. And so we, we, we're we not where we should have really been. So these numbers are driving the price of property and then all the different types of Lulus that you get when there is a lease renewal and so forth like that. Um, it, it will ultimately drive that person out of that unit. It won't be long. Right now, there's a property across the street from my office where the woman was offered $175,000 to move. It's not an HDFC. She's on the ground floor of a historic property, and they would give her $175,000 to take a walk. And I guess just I want to thank the chair for indulging my questions. Thank I you guess so much. A, a, a final question would just be, uh, we mentioned all these goodies in terms of having all the tax debt eliminated, having the water debt eliminated, receiving money to do the work zero interest loans, uh, would HDFCs, and, and in terms of for the elected or soon to be elected officials and your, your roles, would the tenants be open to the fact that, not necessarily some of the regulatory issues that happen, but would the tenants be open to the fact that they wouldn't be able to sell their units at above market for another 40 years, that their units would have to remain affordable for another 40 years? Uh, the thing being that after that 40 years, and actually usually around 15 to 30 years, you can start selling your units at, at higher than at, at market sometimes. So I guess, is, is it a priority for the tenants to have housing that they can, would tenants prefer to be renters? Would they prefer to be owners? And are they okay with keeping it a home, an affordable home ownership opportunity for longer? I, I can't speak for the masses. I, I think that would be a good, a, a good piece, uh, if, if that, that would be better than being a renter for those that um, want to be shareholders, that, that would be a, a good move. Um, we could probably give you an answer on that, but I, I, I can't see why people wouldn't want it. Because we're talking about stability, we're talking about um, the integrity of our community, and in the legacy of, of your children, our children, being able to have something that's passed along and know that you're not going anywhere for the next 40, 50 years. I, I think that that would be great. I have the luxury of not chairing this hearing, okay. so I can tell you that I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, and I know one of my colleagues left who was asking about management, but HPD also has systems where they allow the homeowners to maintain ownership and work with not community-based nonprofits to step in as managers to get things back on track and support the tenants in managing their buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are going to go to the next panel. I want to thank you for your testimony. I think it's uh, you, very Mr. helpful Chief. in helping us form uh, what happens going forward. I do want to say that uh, today's vote will consist of the removal of half of the units that were on the TPT process or on the TPT slate for Manhattan. Uh, Allison Doenges, I'm sorry, I know I ruined that. Uh, Keyshawn Watkins, Gerald Harris, and Luis Codero. Uh, Glorianne. Kirstein. Uh, at the conclusion of this panel's testimony, we will be taking a vote on the three bills that were before us and on the TPT bill. Bills. Bills. 13 of them. Uh, you can begin whenever you like. I just ask for you to, for the record, state your name. Allison DeWenges, I'm with 157 West 123rd Street, HDFC. You can, you can begin testifying. Sorry. 
Um, thank you so much for letting us come and speak with you today. As I just said, I'm a shareholder at 157 West 123rd Street, which is a, a 51 unit building in Central Harlem. I am not an original shareholder who paid $250 for my apartment. I paid a mortgage worthy amount for my apartment and I'm so afraid of losing that and everything. I'm a single mother and I can't imagine losing my housing or my equity. We are working hard at moving um, towards the future in a positive way that will provide our building with financial freedom and to move away from our debts. Our board has implemented new policies and procedures and our management company is also working hard supporting us. I hope we have your support in this moment of crisis. I want to thank the HDFC coalition and HSC management for going above and beyond and helping us to get on a path to success. Also a very special thank you to council member Bill Perkins for believing in us and allowing us this opportunity to move forward with affordable housing here in New York City. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Luis Cadero. I'm representing 526 West 158th Street. Mr. Cadero, I can't hear you. Okay. My name is Luis Cadero. Okay, that's a little bit. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm representing 526 West 158th Street. Um, first of all, I got to say, Thank you to all of you. We are an HDFC co-op in Washington Heights with 28 family, mostly of Latinos, and we have been shareholders from 1989, which I haven't, I wasn't one of the original ones. I was the second uh, of the last to buy. I, I bought in August of 2012. Um, we've been working very hard, thanks to Councilman Mark Levine, the HDFC coalition, for helping us to get things right. It has been a, a little difficult, as the other people were saying before, sometimes with management, sometimes with the other people that were doing stuff that they were just on their own. They're, most of them were just thrown out there, the building is yours, um, do what you need to do. And sometimes it's management is what actually um, made it fall. And sometimes trying to catch up to some of the stuff that has happened, like with us, we didn't have uh, the dam tax. We were the, one of the highest paying buildings in, in all of Washington Heights and maybe this, the whole city. We were paying 93000 a year. So it was actually us trying to catch up and always playing catch up and not able to succeed. So I am saying thank you to all of you for, for helping us also with Article 11 and tax amnesty application. Um, we are asking to hear us out you know, we are hardworking people, we are trying. Sometimes you're thrown out there without knowing much what to do. And thank you, um, especially HDFC Coalition for helping us and guide us. I think the city should have more people to help us out, you know, and, and it should be a, a program that the city should see that it is going out to the city, helping out and guiding most of us that were blind at one time. So it was like the blinds guiding the blinds. Uh, we have now a purpose, we are learning, we are understanding, we are all working together to get things to go properly. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Before the next testimony, can I just ask uh, Will Buckery to join the panel? Just state your name for the record. Oh, sure. Glorianne Hussey Kirstein. I am an HDSC shareholder at West 106th Street in Manhattan Valley, part of the Upper West Side. I've been in my building for 36 years. I'm an original shareholder who bought for 250 in my building. I worked for HPD for 26 years in code enforcement. I'm retired now for the past four years. On the other hand, I'm not so retired because for the past two years, I joined the HDSC coalition to try to oppose city policies that were harmful to the HDFC community. And to our shock and amazement a year and a half ago, that's when we found out that the city of New York was bringing a mass foreclosure action against HDFCs. At this point, 53 HDFCs are facing foreclosure in one year when between 1997 and 2016, 96 HDFCs were foreclosed on. So for 17 years, 96 HDFCs, one year 53. 
of those 53 HDFCs facing foreclosure, 90% were incorporated in the 1980s and 1990s, so they're between 25 and 35 years old. So why now? What has happened? Why are these HDFCs facing foreclosure? That's the question of the day. And we, the HDFC Coalition, by the way, you're hearing a lot about us, uh, we decided a year and a half ago to start going out to these HDFCs to find out what the problems were. And we've been to 32 HDFCs in three boroughs over the past 14 months. And here's what we have found. As I experienced when I was in the TIL program before becoming a shareholder is lack of training. HDFC shareholders, when they were first tenants, did not get training in housing court procedures. They didn't get training in probate court requirements when a shareholder dies. And believe me, if you're incorporated in the 80s and 90s, you do have shareholders who leave or who die or go to nursing homes. You didn't get training in negotiating commercial leases. We have found 50% of the HDFCs facing foreclosure have commercial establishments with, uh, with leases in place that were struck by HPD, and those leases did not include text that required the commercial establishment to pay the commercial tax, number one, nor did that uh, commercial lease also require a separate water meter, and most of these commercial establishments are laundromats, they are nail salons, they are uh, restaurants that use heavy, heavy water usage, and all that cost goes to the co-op, and the co-op never got training to make sure those costs passed on to the commercial establishment. So therefore, people are being caught in this vice where a lack of training has put them underwater in terms of the debt that they have now mounted up. Also, the lack of early notification, 10 years. It's been 10 years since the last round of TPT, so that means these debts got built up for 10 years when in the old days they used to give you early warning. After a year, you started getting posters in your building that you're four quarters in arrears, and you could manage that debt. Now you have a debt that's in the millions of dollars because of all this lack of training, the lack of notification. Uh, Mr. Cornegie, you asked about what could be the resources that could be extended. Let me tell you what the HDFC Coalition has done in the past 14 months that we've gone out to these 32 HDFCs. We have done the Article 11 tax amnesty application. We have the services of a tax expert who grew up in an HDFC for free, and what we do is we do a five-year budgeting plan, we do a five-year marketing plan, most also a lack of training in how to deal with vacancies and how to conduct sales, all right? We give the HDFC shareholders that we've been meeting with courage, we give them a morale boost, we give them technical assistance, and we've also been there. I was on my board for 17 years, believe me, I know, and we're self-managed. I know the problems that a shareholder can face, and what we say to them is, there is hope. We can turn you around, and they listen to us. And by the way, 12 of those HDFCs that we have helped are on your ballot today to be taken off the foreclosure list, and we hope that you will vote unanimously for all 12 of them. Sorry that I have to cut off right now, but thank you for listening to us. The coalition feels as though we have a lot to share with you, and we want a working group going forward with the agencies involved, Water, HPD, Department of Finance, City Council, and the coalition to scrutinize the TPD program and try to create an environment where we never have to come to this kind of decision again. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Gerald Harris. I'm from 527 West 151 Street. I'm the president of the board. I have been since 2000, we, well, since 1990. We purchased in 2000. We are under the Article 11. When we first got the building, we weren't told that all these bills was gonna come at us. They gave us a good thing. Oh, we're gonna get washing machine hookups and everything. We had the washing machine hookups not realizing that the water bill was gonna go as high as it was. The water bill is ridiculous. I've shut down the machine, washing machine hookups, which that takes away from the building, but everybody understands why it was done and what it was done for. We're asking that, which we have already applied for the Article 11, we're asking that you help us with the water bill. That's our main problem right now. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Keyshawn Watkins, representing 525 West 151st Street. And uh, I just would like to say that um, for years, we were under the impression that, you know, HDFCs were low income. And um, we didn't know at all that you could get, or you could rent fair for fair market rate for apartments that were not uh, purchased. So uh, 
in in our building case, we just kept it. We kept the uh, we kept it so low that we didn't have enough income coming in to actually keep up with the bills that were coming in. So that was just a question I always had. Like, if it's supposed to remain low income, how do you keep all the bills up that come with it? If you know, and keep it low income and maintain the bills that come with the property. Thank you. And thank everyone for helping out. Everyone that's on the ground helping us out. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Captain. Uh, good morning. My name is Will Buckery, and I'm an uh, HDFC member. Uh, uh, HDFC and a Housing Coalition member. Um, I want to th thank you for this for this audience and, and a chance to speak. Um, we're, we've been fighting for a couple years now, trying to save a lot of buildings. And, um, and, and thank you to our spiritual leaders, uh, Glory uh, Kirstein here, and Victor Morissette, who is not here with us today. Uh, but. They've done so much with the Article 11 and education, not just educating us, uh, but educating many of the buildings that we, we go to. And when we go to these buildings, my building was one that was in foreclosure, and we were pulled back. We, we, we were saved. We were on the brink of going out. But a lot of uh, nice people rallied uh, to our uh, defense. In those days, it was this really nice, nice man, Councilman Stan Michaels, uh, helped us in those days, as well as some others. But, we find that, if I can just say something parenthetically here, uh, integrity. I watch a lot of the city uh, council proceedings, and I see integrity at all kinds of levels. Carlina Rivera, uh, Bill Perkins, uh, Mark Levine. I, I see so much integrity, and, I w and that's where, to me, the integrity almost lives and dies at the city council. Once you get up to those higher offices, I don't know if they're compromised by the donations, the gifts, but somehow that integrity that you see so much, how people speak from their hearts at the city council here, that here we are in the greatest city in the world with the greatest city council and, and who have been helping us. What has happened so far was a result of the coalition fighting and a result of the coalition, or the, the city council uh, helping us. And it was one of the things that helped my co-op come back uh, from, the, from the brink. But I want to say there's so much to do, so much more to do, that sometimes you see what you think is a, a finish line, but you have to always act as though there's so much more to do, and there is. And Glory's uh, testimony tells you what we've done and also what's left to be done. I mean, it's simple. If you saw two entities sinking, and one was a small child, which represents many of the people in our uh, co-ops, you see a small child sinking and a corporation sinking, who do you throw the lifeline to? I know at that higher level with the House of Representatives and the Senators, they throw the lifeline to the corporation, but I'm, I'm just hopeful that this city council will continue to throw the lifeline to the small child. That's the HDFC co-ops. Mr. Thank Buckery, you. thank you for that analogy. That clears it up for me. Um, uh, unfortunately, your testimony will not be the last that we'll hear. We'll hear uh, from uh, Mr. Joseph Fobbs, and that will be the last testimony for today. Y'all don't have to abandon Mr. Fobbs. Yes. yes, hi, my name is Joseph Fobbs. I am the property manager for 286 West, 151st Street, HDFC. I'm sorry for my tardiness, but um, I was with the inspector um, clearing up some violations that should have been cleared up a while ago. Um, when I was at um, Joe Perkins' office, we, we discussed that, and the HDFC def definitely mentioned that we were gonna have them cleared up. So that's what, where I, why I'm so, so late. Um, I'd like to speak today regarding the culture. All right, um, I work with a lot of HDFCs, and the one thing I do realize is it's a, it's a culture, and if, um, if the co-op board and the shareholders would get a lot of additional education, I think the culture would change. Um, a lot of what I realize is that 
um, understanding the proprietary lease, the bylaws, and the house rules. That's the Bible, right? And a lot of if a lot of the HDFCs go by that, a lot of these things can be methods can be cleared up. A lot of the problems is right there in the bylaws, proprietary lease, and house rules. But the, a lot of the problem is a lot of the shareholders, board members don't really deal with that. So if we could get assistance in making sure that that culture is along the lines of, listen, if there's something you need to deal with, go to the bylaws, it's right there. Go to the rules, it's right there. And I believe that it would be, everything would be gay. In regards to um, the building that I'm working with that was in this unfortunate situation, um, we went about doing things on the legal aspect where we decided to um, do things according to the law and things started to change. Okay, so, and I believe it, it, it's the base, based on having the culture change. And once we're educated on the right way to do things, that's when the culture starts to change. And I believe the board of directors are, is now focused on doing that. Um, and I believe that we'll be in a very good situation moving forward. And I thank you um, for allowing us this opportunity. I'm done. So thank you for that testimony. That was um, uh, very valuable from a, a management standpoint to hear that you're not just talking about facilities and, and that kind of thing, but you're, but you're talking about changing the culture and educating uh, the board members, which I think is a consistent theme of what we've heard here uh, today, right? So there was, I'm old enough to remember the commercial that said, uh, an educated consumer is our best customer. So I think um, uh, that, that, that applies here as well. So some people are laughing because they remember the Cy Sims commercial. Everybody else, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. So we are going to convene now to have the vote. Uh, do we have quorum? I'll ask. Uh, Matthew DeStefano, committee clerk, committee on housing and buildings, roll call vote. Chair Cornegy. I vote aye. Cabrera. Chin. Espinel. I vote aye. Rosenthal. Aye. Torres. Williams. Um, I just want to thank the chair for uh, this hearing and for uh, helping out these buildings. I would like to keep an eye, because I do have the bill for the moratorium. Uh, but I want to keep an eye on what the, the council is doing to see if it's necessary or not. So I just want to um, put that out there. Thank you. Uh, that will eye on all. Rodenchik. Perkins. Thank you. I just want to make a brief. I, obviously, I'm voting aye, but I wanted to just um, reflect on the, uh, for a quick sentence or so, the heroic efforts that were made to revitalize this city at a time when there was so much abandonment and on the brink of bankruptcy, and uh, where we are today is, is, one might say, is a miracle, <laughs> but uh, it was a miracle that obviously was uh, the result of a lot of folks on the grassroots level uh, digging into the neighborhoods that had been abandoned and deciding that um, they could make a better day. And so it's a wonderful thing to see, and glad to be back to see the fruits of their labor, which has resulted in the city back on its feet, and moving forward. I think it's Go important, down. though, to acknowledge uh, what Councilmember Perkins said and the historical context that finds us where we are today. So thank you for that. Okay. Councilman, what, your vote? Councilmember Perkins? Aye. Thank you. Uh, Joe and I. Aye on all. Rivera. Proudly standing with my East Village and Lower East Side HDFCs, I vote aye. By a vote of seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, the items have been adopted. Uh, yes, I think that we are going to hold the vote open for the next 10 minutes to get those, the votes of those people who are close by. So the roll will be held open for 10 minutes. <laughs> 